knows a lot about the science stuff, Professor Dave explains. We have covered two of Maxwell's four equations for electromagnetism, those being the two forms of Gauss's law. In this tutorial, we will examine Faraday's law. Through a series of experiments that took place in 1831, Michael Faraday demonstrated that an electric current may be induced in a circuit by changing the magnetic flux enclosed by that circuit. This discovery can be extended to more general usage if we simply say that a changing magnetic field produces an electric field. This may seem like the opposite property of that discussed in the previous tutorial on Gauss's law for the magnetic field. However, the induced electric fields created via a moving magnetic field are very different from the fields traditionally produced by electric charge alone. Faraday's law is capable of handling the interaction between electric charge and an induced electric field. The differential form of Faraday's law states that a circulating electric field is produced by a magnetic field that changes with time. The term on the left, which involves the cross product of the del operator and the electric field, is called the curl of the electric field, as we may recall from one of the mathematics tutorials. And this is used to quantify the circulation of that field. The curl measures the circulation of a field about a single point, or essentially how much it curls. For a normal electric field that originates from electric charge, the curl is always zero. This is one of the primary differences between a normal electric field produced by charge and an induced electric field. The term on the right shows the rate of change of the magnetic field with respect to time, dB over dt. The negative sign is necessary for the induction to follow the right-hand rule. Where there are no negative sign, the electric field would curl in the wrong direction. Again, curl refers to how much the field circulates or rotates around a given point. The integral form of Faraday's law looks like this. We have the path integral of the electric field being equal to the opposite of the derivative of the surface integral of the dot product of the magnetic field with the normal unit vector. So what we mean by that is that on the left side we have the electric field integral taken along a path. This is meaningless without the context provided by the right side. The result is a scalar electromotive force. Then, on the right, the negative sign is to conform to the right-hand rule. The surface integral is essentially the same as that from Gauss's law, but with one key difference. It's the magnetic flux through any surface, open or closed. If it is closed, flux will equal zero, and it doesn't change with time. The derivative d dt indicates that we are measuring the change in flux with respect to time. So this essentially states that a changing magnetic flux through a surface induces an electromotive force in any boundary path of that surface, and a changing magnetic field induces a circulating electric field. This formula can be particularly confusing, as it combines two somewhat separate ideas into one formula. Let's skip the electromotive force for now and look at the idea of the induced electric field. This principle governs all power plants that generate electricity using turbines. Simply put, a magnetic bar is rapidly rotated around a conductor to produce a current. However, a current is just a set of moving charges. It's not the electric field itself. The magnetic field only induces this field, which then creates a vector field that influences the charges to move. When people talk about induction, they generally speak of the magnetic field inducing a current, and while this isn't precisely what Faraday's law holds, it is essentially an irrelevant distinction. An electric field induced by a magnetic field will always produce a current. Each part is directly related. However, this distinction is important in an interesting way. The induced electric field differs from that produced by a charge or set of charges. The induced electric field has field lines that loop, like the static magnetic field, while the standard electric field has field lines that terminate at charges. But how can we relate the changing magnetic field to the current it induces? 
Note the statement in the first part of the integral form. A changing magnetic flux through a surface induces an electromotive force in any boundary path of that surface. The boundary path can be practically anything, but it is convenient to use symmetrical objects in practice due to their simplicity. The mathematical tool most often used to evaluate this situation for the electric field is the path integral, represented here by this double integral with the symbol C. As one might imagine, this integral is evaluated upon a specific path. The beginning and end points might be the same, but the integral will differ depending on the path taken between the two points. If the path this integral operates on is closed, that is, it finishes where it started, then the left side of Faraday's law represents the circulation of the electric field around a given path. When this circulating of the electric field is acting upon a known charge, it does work on that charge, called the electromotive force, or EMF. This term is confusing, as it most certainly is not in the right units for force. Rather, EMF is in units of force per unit charge over the integrated distance. Nevertheless, it is the standard terminology for electromagnetism. What then is the circulation of the electric field around a path? It is just the work done by the electric field in moving a unit charge around that path. The right-hand side of Faraday's law may seem intimidating at first. However, on closer examination, we can see that one term is simply the magnetic flux, represented by phi sub b, equal to this surface integral. When combined with this time derivative, it creates a more complex meaning than simply a changing magnetic field. Look closely at this flux equation for elements that might change with time. First, the magnitude of the magnetic field B might change, causing the number of field lines penetrating the given surface to change. Second, the angle of the field relative to the surface might change, represented by the normal vector, thus reducing the effective flux through the surface by changing the direction of the field or the orientation of the surface. Finally, even if the magnitude and direction of both B and N remain the same, the surface itself might vary, creating a change in flux. Each of these changes, or some combination thereof, will cause the right side of Faraday's law to take on a non-zero value. Remember, Gauss's law for the magnetic field states that the magnetic flux through a closed surface must be zero. Faraday's law deals with any surface, open or closed, that can be bounded by a closed path. Let's consider the physical nature of these principles, as Faraday once did, in discovering them. A magnetic bar held stationary in the presence of a circuit, or a very long wire, does not produce an electric current within the circuit. There is magnetic flux, but because it is not changing with time, no current is induced. Moving the bar towards and away from the circuit would induce a current, however, as would changing the size of the circuit or rotating the bar end over end. Of particular note is a peculiar principle. The induced EMF is not dependent on the strength of the magnetic flux, but rather on how fast it changes over time. There is a great deal of physics wrapped around the remaining term in Faraday's law, the minus sign. It is so important that it has its own name, Lenz Law, discovered by Heinrich Lenz, a German physicist. He noted a particular insight about the direction of the current induced by the magnetic flux, as prescribed by Faraday's law. Lenz's insight was this. Currents induced by a changing magnetic flux always flow in the direction necessary to oppose the change in flux. Thus, as the magnetic flux through the circuit increases, the induced current produces its own magnetic flux in the opposite direction to offset the increase. It is important to understand that a changing magnetic flux induces an electric field whether or not a conducting path exists where a current might normally flow. Lenz law tells us the direction of the circulation of the induced electric field around a path, even if no conduction current actually flows along that path. And with an assessment of Faraday's law complete, let's move on to our fourth and final of Maxwell's equations. 
Thanks for watching. Subscribe to my channel for more tutorials. Support me on Patreon so I can keep making content. And as always, feel free to email me, ProfessorDaveExplains at gmail.com.